Okay, welcome to uh, this module on fire and smoke doors. I have a subtitle, The Surveyor's Dream and Possibly Your Nightmare. Um, it has been a focus of surveyors in just recent years um, to, pay, to pay a lot more attention and time to uh, doors um, in healthcare. And uh, also to really be drilling into uh, NFPA 80, which is the main support document for folk, uh, for uh, openings and uh, penetrations and other things, uh, other other uh, uh, fire and uh, smoke controlling devices. Um, but when it comes to this section, we're going to be talking about breaking down the sort of the fire doors inside firewalls, the smoke door inside of a smoke wall, and the um, you know smoke partition doors and openings. And hopefully give you a good foundation so when you walk into the healthcare environment, again, you can truly be different day one. You can have a whole new appreciation for the requirements and for the maintenance and for, if you will, the opportunities you have to manage this very critical piece that we're being measured against. Um, and, and if we don't, we're going to continue to get gigged. I, I really believe, and it has been in recent uh, months and years, you know, fire, fire doors have become the new barrier uh, problem for us. When you look at the um, the the number of of sightings we have uh, in hospitals, um, doors have has moved up to being up there in the top five consistently now, uh, because there are so many of them, and actually we just haven't really gotten it under control yet. So, hopefully, having a good understanding of what they are and having an understanding of what you can do to manage them will help you be different as you uh, are doing your job and enter into a role as a facility manager. So again, let's jump right into it. We're going to uh, start by just looking at some examples um, and then we're going to jump into the different types and then close it out with maintenance and the opportunities we have to sort of reduce the workload if possible. Welcome to Fire and Smoke Doors. The NFP code books that we'll be touching in uh, primarily will be NFPA 101 um, life safety code. Uh, if you really want to take a hard look at that, you know, we're going to be looking at chapter 8 uh, pr predominantly when it comes to this. And then also chapter 18 and 19, that's where that e it exists on doors and openings. And then NFPA 80, uh, fire doors and rated opening, that's the, that's the heart of understanding the maintenance and uh, the requirements of operation and maintenance of doors. Uh, 105, um, smoke control door assemblies. This one here is more involved because, again, when you get into um, HVAC and heating and cooling, and again, it's not heavy, and we're only going to touch on a little bit, but this is this is where, um, you know, when you're trying to control the air as it relates to smoke, how it affects doors and openings is a little bit different. So we're not going to go on that very deeply, but these are the primary books when it comes, comes to doors and openings that we're going to be touching on and that you'll probably need to become expert at over your time in the facility management career. You know, let's start out by looking at, you know, this is a, a classic thing you hear about. Um, I, do, I, I, I just can't believe that you would find this anywhere in a healthcare environment. But unfortunately, um, you do find extraordinary things like this where you have an emergency exit that is not just locked once, but twice. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, lots of times you'll see this probably in communities where, you know, maybe there is <clears throat> you know, a lot of crime, um, you know, cities and stuff like that. But uh, obviously something you never want to see um, in an in a egress. And we're going to look at a few more. You know, can you find what's going on here? This one is, is a little bit comical. Um, you know, uh, with all your, your training, I, I think the trained eye, you might think, well, let's see, maybe it's the fact that that fire extinguisher is not mounted. Um, or maybe it's the paper on the door. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe it's the fact that it's propped open. And really, that's really the main thing here is the door's being propped open. And I guess they thought maybe they were being, you know, this is fire protection for a propped up a door by putting a fire extinguisher there. Uh, let's see how you do on this next one. Okay, well, something's odd about this door, isn't it? Um, if you look at the hinge assembly and you look at the modifications to the door, you have to wonder if that's a rated modification on that hinge and it probably is not. I love this one here because that little label it says fire keep door shut. <laughs> 
and then they locked it and then you gotta love this down here now this is may not be a rated door this may be a uh, a partition uh, it could be a hazardous space possibly it actually says fire door so no it's not a partition this is actually a rated door or meant to be a rated door it has been modified significantly uh, this certainly would not pass uh, any kind of inspection okay next one hmm okay well initially um, I think that your eyes are drawn to probably this damage right here um, I think that damage would probably I'm going to play with my pen here a little bit this is kind of you know a little feature working on oh yeah that's probably the issue and 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 very likely that would be an issue because that is a definitely a damaged door but really the issue on here is over here if you look here what is that not a very good drawing um, that's a plate that's a that's a plate that is supposed to identify um, you know the uh, let me erase that uh, that's supposed to identify you know the rating of the door and you can see by the coloring of the uh, door over here all this color well that color on that plate happens to be the same color so I'm pretty certain you're not going to be able to see um, the rating on that plate let's try the next one okay this is kind of the same thing here we go if you see the color there's the uh, rating um, and you're really not going to be able to make that out and here is that's the door frame rating and over here is the door rating and again it's been painted over and that certainly is going to be a violation that you see pretty commonly in healthcare facilities and lots of facilities. how about this one well hmm Let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Maybe there's another one. 24. 24 holes in a door. Now, of course, you know, you got to wonder why so many holes. And obviously, your first question is going to be, well, you know, I bet you they put in different closers on here. And that's absolutely the truth. And this is probably one of those doors that gets used so frequently um, <clears throat> and it's been damaged and um, it's been wore out and they've had to is a very very heavily used door I imagine where they've had to keep trying different closers to try to satisfy issues and uh, you know keep the door working so <clears throat> who knows what else is going on but this is an obvious violation on a door and I wanted to show you this because you know when a door is doing its job and you have a major fire and if it's if the wall and the door system does its job this is what you really end up this is pretty much all you see I mean you see just a little bit of smoke that's made it through the door and maybe around the edges a little bit when on the other side there is just absolute devastation and I know in our course you've seen a few pictures like that and if you do a few searches you'll find that to be the case that amazing how real proper design how it can contain a fire and therefore that's really why all this attention is being paid you know it is a requirement to maintain these fire barriers and we spent a lot of years talking about you know and, and we talked about in a presentation about making sure that we have those penetration sealed with proper material UL rated and so on and so forth but sometimes we look right past what's right in front of us and that's the doors themselves if they are not maintained properly then you know we've really done a, a disservice to the safety of our patients and our buildings by not doing that now let's continue let's go on with the uh, with the um, um, presentation here and let's get educated on on doors oh here's a, here's a good question you know why do fire and smoke doors have a lower rating than walls and the answer is right here it's primarily due to the fact that there will not be combustible load up against or on a fire door in a corridor or hallway or, or, or passage entry in fact there really almost can't be it'd be very rare to find a couch sitting up against you know a um, a door and because of that that combustible load is not going to add to the intensity of the fire during a fire at that point whereas on a wall when you have that combustible load very likely or possibly sitting up against the wall you're going to have something burning against the wall that's going to focus the fire and the flames on that part of the wall and that's the reason why you know the rating of walls are higher if you will than doors or you could say the rating of doors are lower than walls is because the chances of there being a fire at the door on the door is very 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 unlikely you know and again as you may or may not know 
you know, you're not allowed to put things on the door that are combustible. I mean, you shouldn't be putting paper and, you know, boxes and wreaths and things like that, which does happen uh, during seasonal times. But you, you're supposed to keep all combustible loads off of fire doors and uh, smoke doors and so on and so forth. So that's the reason why, if you ever wonder why that is. This is a great little um, drawing that talks about and gives you a nice overview of fire ratings. Um, and you can see here the picture um, over here to the left, the different images. You know, the, the, this picture here shows two different buildings. And essentially it says this four hour rating wall with a three hour rated door opening is designed to separate buildings, you know, typically. They're completely fire code structures. And then you get into the two hour rated, okay, or 90 minute door. And this is really used to uh, block, typically it can be separations on buildings and occupancies, but also really like stairwells or egresses or vertical communications. Um, and again, it says elevator shafts. So this is to, uh, it's really a, a place of last protection, if you will, for people who are trying to get out of the building or are maybe using the elevators as a way to, again, get out of the building if you have the right setup for that. Um, and then you will also see 2R rating when, it's, when you see for separating occupancies, uh, such as like maybe a, a business building from a hospital that are connected to the same building. Um, and again, and it, and again, it does say this here, although I, I think that, um, you know, my experience has been it's more 2R, but it says uh, a 1R and a 60 minute door is divided to uh, frame to somebody to buy occupancies in a building. Um, and I've typically seen more 2R than 1R. Um, I'm thinking this is an IBC rating. I think healthcare may have a little different uh, look at this, but for the most part, um, again, uh, it's saying here that it's for uh, framed assemblies, divided occupies and buildings. Now, when you get down to the one hour and three quarter hour door, this is really getting down to uh, partitions and corridors. And in our case, typically this is what we're gonna be talking about um, uh, even smoke part, uh, smoke partitions, or not partitions, excuse me, smoke barriers or hazardous spaces and non-sprinkled or egress corridors or things like that um, that are rated for fire. And they're gonna, if you have a fire rated one hour corridor or room, it's gonna have a 45 minute door. And then you get to the two hour rating with a 90 minute um, rating here, um, which again, um, this is, says this is opening is in a wall where there is the potential for severe fire exposure from the exterior of the building. So on exterior parts of the building, when there's some sort of, let's say you have some kind of a space or room or combustible load that potentially could cause a fire next to the building. And again, here it's showing like shrubs, I think. Um, then you have a, a, a two hour and a 90 minute rating for exterior. And then exterior one hour with three quarter. Um, when there is a, it says when there's a light fire, potential. Um, so exterior doors going out, if I guess uh, if you're going out a door and there's a lot of high potential for fire, it's going to be a two hour with a 90 minute. But if it's a low potential, one hour and 45 minute. I think uh, my experience has been typically, I think most doors, regardless, I've seen in healthcare are two hour and 90 minute versus the one hour and 45 minute. And then we get down to this one hour in the third hour or 20 minute and these are really when we get down to, uh, in this case, it's talking about smoke and draft control is required. But also, this is where we're getting into, um, particularly in healthcare, partitions, or you get into um, uh, corridor doors, um, egress doors that, that work two ways. And we'll talk about that and during the presentation. So a, a kind of a nice little high-level drawing. I think there are a few um, exceptions within this, but there aren't too many. This is going to cover pretty much, you know, 90 plus percent of door ratings that you're going to run into when it relates to fire doors. And I want to talk about another definition here, um, and that's the difference between self-closing and automatic closing. And this is from NFPA 80, 2010. And there is some confusion between self-closing doors and automatic closing doors. I mean, and, and you can get yourself turned around pretty quick with this. Self-closing doors are doors that, uh, when open release, they return to the closed position. So, um, when really what we're coming down to is that the door will always close. Uh, you can't get it to hold open. It may have self-closing hinges, which forces it to close. 
Um, it may have a closer um, that forces it to close. But anyway, you look at it, it, that door will just, it will close. Um, it will close no matter what, unless of course it's blocked open. And I had mentioned here, hold opens. Um, and actually, I just I read uh, when I was doing my research here that hold opens, actually if there's a hold open on a door like this, it's no longer a self-closing door. It then becomes an automatic closing door. Even if it has a device that's meant to close it all the time or closing hinges, the moment you put a hold open on it, it becomes an automatic closing door. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind when it comes to these doors is that these are the doors that people like to get uh, little wood chucks, um, you know, hold open uh, wedges, or they'll tie them open and things like that because they're often on corridors that are egresses that um, are either going to be a smoke partition or possibly even a smoke barrier. And the people who l occupy those spaces, what we do in off lot in healthcare is we will change and convert spaces to offices and they don't want to have the doors closed, so they'll block them. And again, this is one of those push and pull issues. Um, and you know, sometimes what you can do is you can, you can, you can change it to an automatic closing door, which will release in case of a fire, um, or you can put a hold open on it. Um, and those are probably your, your better options versus uh, having people block them open. And then you get to the automatic closing door, which we talked about a moment ago. And this is the door that's normally open that closes when the automatic closing device is activated. And these can be the releases and the hold opens. Um, this can be, um, you know, things that are tied to your smoke detector, uh, tied to your fire alarm, and and they, and they release the door. Now, an uh, important comment here when it comes to um, hold open devices is that, like magnetic devices, and this has happened to me several times where we get into the situation where we do convert spaces over and people want their doors held open and they have an automatic, they have a, I'm sorry, a self-closing door and they want us to put these a hold open on it that'll make it automatic closing. Well, hold opens by their nature require electricity, especially if they're magnetic. And what you often run into is that each um, output on your panel um, that is meant to go out like an electronic signal that goes out to those mags to to electrify the um, magnetic hold every time you add one, another door you divide your current a little bit and you will get to the point where you will divide your current down to where it won't hold any doors um, and I think that sometimes you know we, 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 we find out not necessarily through understanding but through experience but be aware of that that most um, well, all hold open magnetic holes have a limit. Um, what ha often has to happen to increase that limit is you have to expand the number of um, a hold open modules inside of your fire panel. And, and that's, that can get very expensive to put the, to get the bar board in there, to get a program in there, to get the uh, you know, wire cables run out to the space. So this is a very expensive uh, thing to, to do. Now, <clears throat> you can, the automatic closing doors, um, can be more, um, more, more of a low voltage situation, a low current situation, and low signal situation. If you do an automatic closing door that has a mechanism that doesn't hold it open like a mag, but it's held open through the whole through the um, um, th through the hold open device on the door. And what often happens is those devices, uh, they're, they're they have a mechanical hold on them, so you can push them and hold them open. And then when the signal from a fire panel or smoke detector or otherwise triggers it just releases that device i mean it actually triggers that device to just like pull a cylinder and then the door will close and that's a nice way to go about um, not having to run wires not having to expire, expand your fire panel it may seem more expensive initially because you have to buy a different closer and mount a different closer and again you do may run into an issue where you're um, modifying the door so you kind of have to make you have to pick your poison which direction you're going to go. Are you going to get you know expand your fire panel, and expand your boards, and you know to add more magnetic holds, or are you going to do an automatic closing device that has more of a, a less impact on your system and releases? And this is really one of those things that when you're doing projects we we rarely consider it, but if we consider it right up front, um, we normally we will get the money for it. But often, when we consider after the fact, it's real difficult to get uh, money approved, and people are questioning, you know, do we have to spend it? And in some cases, we won't spend the money. And next thing you know, now you got a compliance issue where 
people are blocking doors and so on and so forth. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, it's, it's one of those extra little things from experience. Hope to pass along to you to help you avoid running into that as I have in my career. Now let's talk about fire barrier doors specifically. And again, we had a module already where we talked about fire barriers and smoke barriers and smoke partitions. And I'm hoping by the time you, you're listening to this that you feel real confident on what those are. But let's talk about the doors themselves. And let's begin with fire, fire barrier door specifics. Now uh, typically, they are um, in walls that are beyond one hour and typically they will be metal. And the doors themselves are very often beyond one hour, although they can be less. But typically you're gonna see uh, really 45 minute and up um, in one hour walls. And then when you see the ones that are less than an hour, they may often be wood. You know, when you go above an hour, uh, it, it, they, they frequently are metal. And when you go less than an hour um, or an hour or less, they often are wood. And that's just a rule of thumb. It's not a hard, fast rule, but that's what I've experienced as I'm looking at doors over the years. Now, they require a UL listed label or similar. Um, there are other uh, rating institutions that are accepted, but UL is the, is the main institution that you'll see in most doors. Now, no glazing with windows in two-hour or greater in two-hour greater wall. And again, when you look at uh, different tables, you'll find that any walls that are two-hour and greater don't allow you to have any kind of glazing or windows in the door itself. And typically, if there is glazing, uh, typically it's 100 square inches max in fire-rated doors when permitted. And again, sometimes it's not permitted at all. Um, I know we'll find in smoke doors it's different. And um, in low, very low rated walls like partitions, it's different, but typically in a firewall, it's 100 square inches max. So like a 10 by 10 or maybe like an eight by, you know, eight by 10 or eight by 12 window. Um, requires positive latching. Uh, that is uh, always the requirement in fire doors um, with one minor exception. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and then self-closing required. Um, or hold opens. Um, you know, self-closing, as we talked earlier, the doors have to automatic or have to close on their own when not being held. And again, if there's a hold open on that, I guess that makes it automatic closing. But again, they're going to have a self-closing or automatic closing feature always. And their undercuts uh, are three-quarter inch with eighth inch clearance around the edges. Um, and again, there is a conversation about whether or not you need intumescent uh, material um, inside of the uh, on the doors edges or not and I think that's sometimes required and sometimes not required if you can meet the eighth inch clearance uh, but otherwise you may have to add intimate material and again they typically protect other buildings stairwells separating occupancies or hazardous spaces especially hazardous spaces that are in non sprinkled uh, areas so that's kind of the outline of a fire a fire barrier or fire barrier door now let's talk about the anatomy of a um, you know of a door and this one here it, it has a lot of extra things like it almost has like all the things that might potentially be on it I first wanted to point out a couple of things though I mean one thing I thought was kind of funny when I was looking at this was this little right down here I couldn't believe there was actually a toe kick on a fire door I, I when I saw that I, I did pull this off the web and I saw that toe kick. I'm thinking no 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 never ever ever install a toe kick or a hold open on a fire door although I've seen it done I have absolutely seen it done and have had them removed. But that's something you should never do and never allow on a fire door. Um, and the other thing is, too, is it, they didn't make a note on it, but this, uh, this kick plate, you know, code says that you're allowed to, up to 16 inches, put a non-rated kick plate. You can go higher than that, but then it's got to be rated, and that's pretty expensive to do, so likely you won't do it. But typically, you know, the kick plate can go up to 16 inches and be non-rated, so you can apply something on there. And, you know, again, it's just like it says, it's really designed for people who use their feet when they're carrying things, when they, they will kick on a door and scuff it or possibly, I suppose, damage it. And then you get all the other little pieces of the door. And there's lots of pieces here. I mean, um, and I'm not going to go too deep into any of these, but I just want to, so you have, it, you have an idea of just how complex a door can be. Something I've never really seen much of, and that's a floor close, that's a four floor closer. Um, that's kind of unusual. I, I just personally haven't had an opportunity to see that myself. But going around the horn, um, you're going to have, you know, obviously a lot of doors have electric strike plates. You know, that's the, the plate inside here that is used to release doors. And they show different kinds here. This is one kind here. 
for releasing doors and locking doors. Another kind, if you go up top here, you're going to see a couple other kinds. You're going to see the surface mounted electromagnetic lock, which is really common um, in healthcare. And then you're going to see another one, electromagnetic shear locks. That's another common type of a, um, a hold or locking device. And then you got door alarms, you know, on doors very often for. Uh, you, know, you might have these on exterior parts of the building or, or unsecured parts or maybe even like a behavior health or something like that. And then you're going to have your, you know, you're going to have um, your different uh, mullions and uh, mortises here to uh, that really that, 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 that are part of the structure, the frame of the door and the handle um, of, the, of the door and opening of the door. Um, again, real common. Um, and there's a, there's a comment here about the different uh, electrified hinges and, and electrified pivots that you might have on doors. These releases are pretty typical, especially tied into this PIR. Um, you know, and the PIRs are these are infrared sensors that, that you've seen them. They you know, have green and red lights that change when you get close to release the locks in the door, typically a magnetic lock. Sometimes um, the electric strikes, uh, which are pretty noisy, by the way. And um, and if those fail, you need to have this these wall switches typically. Although there are some recent changes, um, I'm sorry, is that the wall switch? I got a key switch over here. Those are actually uh, handicap wall switches, I guess. Um, usually there is some kind of release as well tied to the door. Um, but in any case, um, you have wall switches, and you also will have releases on an egress door um, too. And magnetic hold, again, these are those devices uh, that this door had a, and you don't see it here, there'd be some kind of a device on the door here that would line up with that, so you could swing the door and you could hold the door. And that's usually what you put in place of these little toe kicks. Um, and door operators, which are real common, and can be a real pain, because they, they, sometimes they, they're, they're an afterthought and you add them later, and uh, they can be difficult to, to fit into space and get electric to them. And of course, lots of walls and doors like this are on exterior walls or very thick walls. So getting power through um, and cables through to these are, are, can be, can be a, quite, a, quite a hassle. Um, and then you can have power supplies which are associated with all of this equipment here that's located above the ceiling and sometimes exterior on the wall, depending upon what kind of space you have and how far, how far you can run. And then you'll see everything things like your, your again, your uh, uh, key switches uh, for setting the door, releasing the doors, uh, excess control, proximity readers that are tied to the door. So, you know, while not all of this stuff would be on any one door, many of these things could be um, on a door um, and actually probably a few other things. So they can be very complex. I think that's the main thing I wanted you to understand is that, that these can be kind of complex. And to understand everything that's going on with the door, you know, it, it, there is something we're going to run into a little bit later as we talk about this in NFP 80, talking about the people that work on doors have to have a certain base knowledge. And, you know, um, anybody that uh, does a lot of doors, and I think we're going to be doing more and more doors, will come up with that knowledge pretty fast. But they have to be trained right in the beginning. And I think that today... We probably have a deficit here with people having good overall knowledge of doors and and what we're doing what you're doing right now is even the knowledge we're about to share today understanding the difference between the different doors and the different walls is a beginning point along with just the, the anatomy of a fire door itself so i hope this gives you just a sense of you know okay we know there's a lot more to doors than i ever thought and we need to study them i think that's the key is not just like oh it's just a door um i think it's important to really train people well and at some point we're going to be talking about competency-based training um, and really you want competency-based training and you know I personally believe that security and maintenance sh should both be trained very very well when it comes to doors because security does rounds they walk through these doors when they're rounding and they can be certainly the eyes and the ears for maintenance and it maybe even have more responsibility than that but uh, I really think that our training when it comes to doors needs to increase and that's it for the anatomy of a door of a fire door that is okay let's talk about the anatomy of a smoke barrier door again we just talked about the anatomy of a fire door now let's talk about a smoke barrier door now smoke barrier doors are typically in a one hour rated smoke barrier wall um, a 30 minute for existing um, prior to 2003 
So when they say that something is existing, um, it's been decided by the standard and code organizations that that is prior to 2003. Um, and they're rated from one hour to 20 minutes based on application. Again, self-closing, positive latching. Again, another distinction here that's very important that was different from fire is no louvers. In a fire door, there are instances where you can have louvers when it's purely a fire door. And the reason why that is, is because the louver has to be rated actually a certain way and has to be fusible linked or has to have an intermessive material in it so that it will close during a fire. That, uh, just so it, it could, and again, it, it maintains the rating of the entire opening of the door. In smoke, as you can understand, um, you're not going to have the heat when you have just smoke, so you can't have louvers. And this creates a lot of problems for us because you'll run into situations where we will change spaces over and convert them to some type of a, maybe even a, um, a IT will grab the space or biomed will grab the space or we'll grab the space and we'll put a little piece of equipment in there that will act as a server or some type of electronic that will have to have some kind of a cooling capacity and that room was never intended to have heat load and so what we end up doing is we end up thinking well we'll just we'll put create ventilation by putting louvers in the door well this is where we run into a problem um, if it's a fire door you can possibly get away with it but if it's a smoke door you cannot get away with it because you just can't have them um, rating labels are required when it comes to smoke barrier doors so if it's a smoke barrier wall and you got doors in it there has to be a rating label that's required Max glazing of 100 square inches typically again, um, so there are some exceptions. Uh, maybe self-closing or automatic closing based on application. And again, you'll often see these smoke barrier doors are wood, although you can't guarantee it. That's typically the case. They're solid core wood. And again, they are, um, they are rated and they have a rating label. Um, corridor smoke barrier dual doors. This is the exception. Uh, when you're dealing with um, doors and smoke barrier doors, in healthcare, we have a little exception, and uh, NFPA is very, very clear about this in um, 18.3.7.6. And because of egress, because during a fire, you're going to be moving um, beds and stretchers and wheelchairs and equipment down the hallway, you don't want to be having to deal with locking mechanisms, potentially jamming up or otherwise, or interfering with uh, the relocation of people inside of a, a compartment from one compartment to another. And in most instances, what you'll see is doors, what's called right-hand egress or swing in the direction of egress, that you know, the right-hand right side of the hallway, if you're walking towards the door, will swing to the right in the way leading you to the next smoke compartment. And then the opposite door will swing right, like, like traffic, and it'll swing the opposite direction. And these, bo these doors will swing different directions, and they won't have locking mechanisms on them. I mean, and they're, they're not positive latched. Um, they may not necessarily have a rating plate. Uh, very often these are three quarter inch solid core doors without a rating plate. And again, um, they, they, they can have plates up to 48 inches from the bottom for the obvious reason because they're in the corridor and they're going to be people going through there might be going through and just pushing a bed and slamming it right into the door. So you want to be able to protect that door from equipment that's going through the door. Um, in some locations, they keep these doors closed all the time, and the door has to swing constantly, um, and therefore it's getting hit constantly or possibly damaged you know, with equipment and such. But all the tolerances still apply. Um, so this is one of those confusions. I mean, I know I've had it where you're, you're looking at these doors, they're in a corridor, and you say, well, this is weird. There's no plate on it. Um, it's not latching. Um, you know, what kind of wall is this? Or what kind of door is this? Because, because of the different years that buildings have been built, you might see on the next floor or right around the corner, a door in the hallway that's in a, again, in a smoke wall, but it has all the features. It's latching, um, it is, um, you know, it's, it's got all of the, uh, uh, the mechanisms on it. And you're thinking, wait a second, that's a barrier wall. This is a smoke barrier wall, but we got two different kind of doors on it. And the reason why that is is because it just comes down to sometimes during modifications and construction. I mean, we don't stay consistent with what we're doing when we're addressing smoke barriers. So it can be very confusing for an FM to be looking at their building and going, huh, why is it in some places I have this and some places I have that? But it's good to know this. And, and again, it still is not a smoke partition. It is a smoke barrier wall because there might be a tendency to think, well, oh, this is a smoke partition. 
when in fact it is a smoke barrier wall. Again, another reason to have very good life safety drawings. And this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, here's a 20 minute dual swing corridor door non-latching. And you look at it and you kind of go, hmm, all right, looks like a, you know, looks like a, 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 a you know, a nice, uh, just a nice door. And it is. And what you notice here too is you notice how this plate's kind of low. Um, and this door obviously doesn't look like it has any hold opens on it. There's no nothing here and there's really nothing on the wall that you can see. Uh, you, you can actually see right here there's actually a doorway it looks like which if it swings right hand it, it'll block that. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, this is one of those things where you do see a lot of these doors and this here could be, it could be a smoke partition, but it also likely could be a smoke barrier and it's accepted in healthcare. Um, and again, there's a little conflict with IBC with this, but NFPA is very clear about it. So that helps to clarify that. Um, here's a classic dual swinging, uh, probably, uh, this here probably is a fire door, but it could be a smoke door as well. Um, you can see immediately um, all the, the latching hardware, or the locking hardware. You can also see up here, you know, the, the closer. Uh, you can see the magnetic hold, and obviously there's a magnetic hold over there. Uh, over here you can see the label on the door, so it's rated. You know, again, you can see this, and this is a corridor. Now, is this a fire rated wall or is this a smoke barrier? Well, guess what? It could be either. And you might just as well see a door like this and a smoke barrier. Um, and then around the corner, see the other wood door possibly in a different construction period that is also in a smoke barrier uh, with no labels and with a different rating. And it sometimes, again, just comes down to, um, you know, who's doing the work, the architects, the engineers, and who's paying attention. So just keep that in mind. It, it definitely can be very confusing. Um, it's nice to have consistency, but unfortunately, due to all the renovation of projects we tend to do, we don't always maintain that level of consistency. But now let's get to smoke partition, the third type of door and the third type of entry. Um, NFPA 101, table 8.3.4.2, and I probably should have mentioned this even earlier, um, shows you a nice layout of the different doors. But this is where it's a nice quick line running across showing you the different things about smoke partitions. Um, one thing here, it says a 20 minute rating. Again, um, these doors may not be rated, but typically in a smoke partition, you have a 20 minute rated door. It may be rated by uh, its, um, uh, may have a label, but also may just be of a certain type. You know, might have three quarter inch solid core, which be acceptable. Um, they are positive latching, okay, um, in the partition. Again, no louvers, uh, gap and undercut apply. Uh, not required to be labeled, I'll give you to mention that earlier, um, in smoke partition wall. I guess that's overstating it because that's what we're talking about. And automatic or self-closing, nearly always solid wood core. In fact, I, it's rare to see something that's not solid wood core in the smoke partition. Um, and typically requires smoke gasket, and this could be a maintenance issue. I think this is one of those things where we just don't think about it. You know, there's a gasket or uh, to seal the smoke to meet the... Uh, to meet the, the meet the gap in the undercut, um, we can fall into the trap of not thinking about that and, and these doors because there's so many of them. Um, typically, these are on corridors um, and rooms and spaces like that. So we just we just sometimes don't even think about them. And uh, it's good to know again on your drawings what doors are in the smoke partition, and know that they have to have a smoke gasket or maintained. What I want to do is I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to jump into now we talked about the different doors and kind of the walls that they're in and the ratings that they have and give you kind of a general overview. Hopefully, you know, that allows you to kind of walk in and sort of get a sense of looking at drawings and looking at walls and kind of go, OK, this is that kind of door. This is that kind of door. But now we really got to talk about maintenance because this is one of those things where, um, you know, NFPA 80 is not one of those books that we typically keep on our shelves. In the, in the healthcare facility management arena. Um, in fact, anymore, you don't have to because you can get to it online. In fact, you all have, are looking at it online for this course. But when you start reading some of the stuff, you, you start to realize, well, gosh, this has been in here for a long time. In fact, uh, most of the things we're talking about, uh, I know go as, at least back to 2007, and it goes back before that. But a lot of us who've been around for a while would say, well, gosh, I didn't know um, that this had been in there. But Here's, here, here we go. I want to go through the maintenance uh, requirements and I want to go through some of the maintenance checks that we're meant to understand about fire and smoke doors. 
So let's start with 5.2.1, and this is, I think this is all out of 2007 or 2010 NFPA 80. Um, fire door assembly shall be inspected and tested not less than annually. Wow, right there it is. And a written record of the inspection shall be signed and kept for inspection by the AHJ. So that right there is a gut, is a gut punch all by itself uh, because that's been in there for a long, long, long time. And I'm willing to bet that some of you probably don't even know, didn't know that existed. And maybe those of you that work in healthcare and those of you coming into healthcare, you're gonna know day one. And so therefore, that's one of why we support the phrase different day one. Um, functional testing of the fire door and windows assembly shall be performed by individuals with knowledge and understanding of the operating components of the type of door being subject to testing. I hope right now you just thought back to that drawing I, I gave you earlier about the anatomy of a fire door and you started to go, hmm, I wonder how many folks that work in my department or my facility have a really good understanding of all those components of a door. And, and that's just really not the tip of the iceberg, but that's a part of what we need to understand. We're gonna go into some more detail here in a moment. Um, and then 5.1.1.2, the requirements of this chapter shall apply to new and existing. New and existing, okay? So you don't get grandfathered on this one. Um, and that's important to know because I think that very often we will plea grandfather and uh, that's just not the case, okay? So this is not your grandfather's exception. NFPA 80 Chapter 5, Care and Maintenance. And this is where the heart of the requirements are. And notice the underlined minimum. These are minimum requirements. Unfortunately, all too often we think if we meet the minimum or try to meet the minimum we have succeeded and in fact we have failed if we have not met the minimum um, I have seen very often and, and I know this is common that people will make goals and improve improvement activities on their performance evaluations or departmental goals actual code minimums that is an absolute no-no I mean when you sit there and say we will check our fire extinguishers, we will try to check our fire extinguishers every month, all of them. <laughs> you can't, you just really can't even, if you do that, you're, you're, you're actually putting out a red flag to the surveyors that you're not checking them. I mean, God forbid you sit there and say, we're going to have a 98% completion rate on fire extinguishers. Well, guess what? The requirement's 100. That's the minimum. And same thing when it comes to doors. So the minimums, uh, we got to figure out how to do the minimums as if it's just, oh yeah, we do that. And here's what we do to improve. So I'd like for you to kind of be thinking about that as we go through this, if these are the minimums. Um, number one, a big one, no open holes or breaks exist in surfaces. We work on doors so often, especially doors that go into like trash rooms or laundry rooms or things like that that are, that are hit and banged. You know, we probably ought to have an assessment that just essentially says that we replace those doors, you know, with some frequency every 10 years or something or five years, because the fact of the matter is that they are going to be heavily used and heavily abused. And we're going to replace, we're going to try to, you know, take off the hold open and put a new one on or a stronger one or a replacement one or whatever. And at the end of the day, we're going to create issues um, for our organization. Um, glazing vision light frames and glazing beads are intact. Again, this is something that has to be verified and they can change. Um, the door frame hinges, hardware, non-combustible, threshold are secure, the line and in working order, and no parts are missing or broken. Uh, that's a tricky one. Um, no parts are missing or broken. I mean, that could be screws. That could be a cover. So got to be very, very careful with this one. This could be left to open interpretation by the AHJ and, um, or the surveyor. And so got to be very careful with, with this. Um, as a minimum, the following items shall be verified. Door clearances do not exceed the clearances listed. Uh, door clearances at the door edge to the frame on the pool side of the door do not exceed clearances listed in 4.8.4.1 and 6.3.1.7. And again, they're pretty much the same. Um, you know, an eighth inch maximum uh, door to frame and at the meeting styles of the pairs. And that's for hollow metal door or wood doors. Uh, a lot of people say like an eighth inch will be the equivalent, I believe, of a nickel. Um, don't hold me to that. Um, but uh, anyway, a lot of people use coins as, as a reference. Um, three quarter inch between the bottom of the door and floor or threshold, 4.8, 4.1. And that's what we call the undercut. 
Uh, it's interesting that Ashy did a, a test years ago to check, you know, how high could you really go before smoke would be a factor in a fire. And it's interesting because I know it's it's been said that it's it's, it's inches upon inches upon inches. I think, I think it's even been said like as much as 18 inches before because smoke will roll from the top to the bottom, and then by the time the smoke gets down to 18 inches, the whole building is engulfed anyway. And they're saying that hey, you know, in theory, you could have an undercut much higher, but the code minimum is three quarter of an inch. Um, While well, we actually went through this slide, I'm going to skip this because we already went over this earlier. But this is, uh, I, I guess, I slipped this slide on self closing or automatic closing, and we talked about that previously. And I'm sure you remember it. This slide here is Chapter 5, uh, Care Maintenance Number 7. Again, the minimum is if a coordinator is installed, the inactive leaf closes before the active leaf. For those of you who aren't familiar with what coordinators are and what they're for, it, when you have two doors that swing, closed, uh, one door is going to become inactive first. In other words, it's going to stop and it's going to latch the second door. And unfortunately, when you have doors like that, unless you have, a, have what's called a coordinator that uh, basically um, coordinates the action to ensure latching occurs properly versus the doors getting jammed up, um, they will often fail. So when you have a fixed door and a door latches against it, there has to be a coordinator that will actually, just as it says, coordinate the doors together. Um, very often, there's another line here that says roller latches are prohibited, um, and that's another topic for another time. But again, it does relate to doors. But again, if you have a coordinator, it has to be, again, it has to be tested to make sure it's working. Again, as the minimum, number eight, latching hardware operates and secures the door when it is in a closed position. It is all too common, unfortunately, for doors not to latch uh, for a myriad of reasons. And I know that all of us who have doors, whether it's in our house or in our rooms or in our bathrooms or either whether it's through, through settling or whether it's through use or abuse um, or just age and time, uh, doors will have a tendency not to latch. And I found that particularly uh, stairwell doors, and this is also a very interesting thing comment here is that you can have latching issues when it comes to building pressurization. Um, I've seen it happen and uh, I've had situations where you have like a really long corridor and you have a door on either end of the corridor that exits the building. And just as timing would have it, you know, people may be holding the door open for a myriad of reasons. They may be um, uh, moving in stuff or taking stuff in and out or maybe a hot summer day or you just have lots of traffic down those corridors or whatever it is but if you get if your building pressurization changes you can almost guarantee you will have doors inside your building that will no longer latch and this is also something to be mindful of when it comes to stairwells again as a minimum auxiliary hardware items that inter interfere or prohibit operation are not installed and again it's this is an interesting one because you just got to be mindful that things change in the environment uh, people add things to the walls. People, you know, you might have um, a nursing floor that says they want some type of glove holder or possibly, let's say, a foam dispenser installed next to rooms. And you got to be aware that you cannot um, place things to interfere with door operation and to interfere with the um, uh, with how much a door is open. I, I just heard of a um, uh, uh, one of the our, our peers out there who was getting gigged by a surveyor for a door that for whatever reason was not held open, um, I believe 90 degrees. Uh, kind of a stretch of an issue, but I don't know if it was, it was related to something being in the way, but he was asking the question about, has anyone you know, else been hit with that citation? My, to my knowledge, I never have. I don't know, again, I don't know the extent of any circumstances, but usually if you're gonna have a problem with hold open on doors, not opening up all the way, it's because someone has placed something on the wall to interfere with the operation of the door. Number 10, no field modification of the door have been performed. Now this one's tricky because I have seen many, many times unknowingly without really knowing about this, I have seen staff modify doors, um, particularly coming to, to uh, holders, um, automatic and um, in hold opens. And um, this is this is a problem in our, in our, in our um, and this is a conflict for us because in theory that if you do modify the door, you're supposed to have it recertified. And there are a number of companies and more and more standing up that'll do that. Um, 
but uh, this is a challenge for us. I mean, to some degree, I think many facilities out there uh, are should be are, are really unable to modify the doors at all. And uh, unfortunately, I think facility managers just don't know this. So um, got to be mindful of that. Again, this is another one of those different day one issues where we've got to have this honest conversation and start doing it the right way. Number 11, again, we talked about this a little bit previously, but gasketing and edge seals uh, are inspected. Again, another critical thing, and this really comes down to knowing what doors are, what type of doors, and what type of edges and seals and gaskets are they required to have, um, whether it's an intumescent or whether it's a smoke for uh, a gasket for smoke. We, we have to know the differences. And um, again, th there is a there is a little bit of a uh, opportunity to get away from some of this maintenance, um, and it's called a performance based option. Um, and this is really coming back down to sort of risk assessments. I mean, if you are able to uh, show through data that your doors, uh, after multiple inspections, um, show a low amount of failure then in theory, what you can do is you can start taking sample sizes, uh, samples of your doors. If you're in a small building, it may not be a big, big deal to inspect, you know, 150 doors annually. But if you're in a campus in a really super large facility that's millions and millions of square feet or even a million square feet, uh, doing doors and checking doors can be quite a burden and a lot of hours. So what you can do is do a performance-based option, which is when you really take a sample size of those doors. And what you need to do is, let's say you have a thousand doors, and you say, well, every year uh, we will check 100 of them. And that as long as your criteria demonstrates or your results demonstrate a compliance of X percent, let's call it 98% or 97%, then you can continue to check just 100 doors. But let's say that your, uh, you know, your 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 compliance uh, says you know you're you're at ninety percent or eighty five percent. Well, guess what? You need to um, increase your uh, number, uh, your testing criteria. Um, and so you know that's kind of how it works. But again, it begins with good data, good information, and good inventory. And when you check those hundred doors, of course, you want to change what doors you're checking. You don't always want to check the same hundred doors. And you want to check and you want to have a risk assessment. Some doors are just going to be less problem for you than others. And you got to be sure to differentiate them. In fact, in my opinion, what you would do is you would do a risk assessment for your doors. You would have some doors that are, you know, that, that, that for example, maybe they're in a high use area, a high equipment area, or maybe uh, they have, maybe there's something about them that just makes them more prone to failing. And those doors you would do regardless you know, every year, just do them every single year. And then you do a, a hybrid, you do performance based on the balance of the doors that are low risk. And then you just do a sampling of those. That way you'd be almost sure to get, you know, very high compliance on the sampling size. And then hopefully um, you have value work on the ones that are high risk. In other words, you are taking care of problems and you're keeping your people very well trained when it comes to doors. But that option is there available to you. Um, Again, we kind of just talked about this. You know, the goals established under a performance-based program shall provide assurance that the fire door assembly will perform its intended function when exposed to fire conditions. And there needs to be a technical justification for inspection. Testing and maintenance intervals shall be documented. And this goes back to what I was saying a moment ago. Having a good risk assessment, I think really thinking your way through it uh, will demonstrate to anybody that comes in the door that you didn't just, you know, willy-nilly say, well, we're going to just sample 100 doors. Okay, well, uh, this pretty much does wrap up our session here on doors and our overview. Again, you know, we talked about the difference between fire doors, smoke doors, and smoke partition doors, and some of the anatomy of those three types. We also hit on maintenance requirements, um, and then the performance-based option. And this here should give you, again, a nice good foundation to walk into a facility and start to dissect very quickly um, you know, what type of doors are in what type of walls with what type of requirements. I, I think, again, uh, this is one of those things that will make you different day one as you go into and are in the HFL environment because, and again, once we get these things under control, I believe, I've found that, you know, once folks get trained up, once folks embrace these things, you find a way to work them into your, um, 
into your work life, uh, sometimes with adding additional personnel and staff occasionally and well, sometimes not. But like anything else, if you are maintaining things, then you should start seeing your preventive maintenance kind of go up and maybe your reactive or repair maintenance go down. And that could be the possibility with this, you know, rather than having lots of repairs that are coming at you from different directions and you're organizing the work differently, you might find that you can actually possibly even decrease, decrease your maintenance time by having a good preventive program, um, you know, on fire doors. And, and it's not just gonna be an additional unfunded mandate and a burden for you, but it's something that you can do effectively and I also find it to be valued work. So again, that wraps up this session. Um, I hope you're able to uh, get through this and I uh, hope this is uh, beneficial to you. In fact, I'm sure it will be, would be, and can be because I know that if I had had this prior to entering healthcare, sure, this would have helped me out an awful lot as well.